professional. Uh, I am very excited to be moderating this panel. I think it's got two very interesting talks to it that I think are going to generate some pretty interesting discussions. And I think we have plenty of time for that. So I look forward to your questions. Uh, I'm Peter Kicker, by the way. I am a, um, a NADSIM coordinator. Um, my research focuses on search and rescue and emergency management in remote communities, particularly in the north, um, which is why I'm particularly excited about moderating this panel about, you know, some of the impacts that we see happening on the environmental side and how that might be mitigated and dealt with moving forward. Um, without, you know, further introduction, though, I, I think we'll, we'll kick things off. And um, what I'll do is read the, the bios of the of our two presenters here first, and then we'll, we'll start the presentations after that, okay? Um, so our first speaker today is uh, Chris Bouchard, who teaches public management at the University of Ottawa, focusing on issues of intergovernmental project delivery, citizen engagement, and governance. She holds an MPA from Dalhousie University, is a Nadsen Doctoral Fellow, and a member of the U Ottawa Centre on Governance. Prior to academia, she worked in the public sector as a planner and has managed transportation infrastructure projects for a variety of government clients as a private sector consultant. And if you've read anything that, uh, that Chris has published through Natson on transportation networks and infrastructure in the North, you know, uh, very much an expert in that area. So excited to hear what uh, you have to say. Uh, Chris's presentation today is Collaborative Governance and Co-Management in Canada's North. And so we'll get that kickstarted in just a second. Uh, our second panelist is, is Joe Crowther, who graduated with an MA in 2022 in political science from the University of Victoria. Um, Canada and has a, uh, a Bachelor in International Relations from the University of Leeds, the UK. Joe is a research fellow with NASN and currently works as a policy analyst with the British Columbia Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Um, so very, very excited to hear uh, your perspective on these issues as well as someone who skirts that kind of academia practitioner uh, um, you know, vein. Very excited. Joe's research today is entitled Bridging the Gap climate change mitigation via policy, academia, and Indigenous knowledge. Um, very excited to hear, to hear both these talks. Let's start us off. Uh, Chris, please, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, uh, Peter. Thanks for that introduction. I'm just going to quickly share my screen because I prepared a few slides to guide us along. Oops. Bear with me a few seconds, sorry. Hmm. Uh, there we go, excellent. There we go. Thanks so much for being with us today, everyone. Uh, as Professor Kicker had mentioned, today I want to talk about collaborative governance and co-management, uh, specifically thinking about the rather distinct and unique circumstances in the North and how some of the public administration literature that's been developed around these issues may or may not be applicable to the unique circumstances of the Northern context. As I'm sure uh, most of you are aware, back in 2019, Canada released its Arctic and Northern policy framework. Um, it was a framework that had been developed over the course of a number of years involving a number of round tables. And it broadly emphasized collaborative governance uh, and evoked themes of co-management. But critics of the framework were somewhat concerned, even in the earliest of days, because there were questions about precisely how such ideas, such high level goals and concepts could actually be implemented. And so I'm going to take a bit of a step back from individual trees to look a bit more at the forest. So we can start to think about some of these issues, some of the uh, difficulties and some of the opportunities of actually achieving these types of goals in the Canadian context. So collaboration, 
what are we talking about? What does it mean? Uh, I've gotten into the habit of actually getting into the etymology of the words that we use. I find it is actually quite useful to ground our thinking. And if we go back to the Latin origin, collaborare, it signifies to labor together. Um, and where it becomes meaningful is where you hope to diminish the command and control hierarchy between people who are trying to achieve a task. Now, something that's interesting as we look into the literature is there's a couple of different directions. Um, there's the more neoliberal direction, which involves how it is that you can have state initiatives enmeshed and interacting with private sector initiatives. So two spheres becoming involved that way through PPPs and so on and so forth. There's actually really quite a lot of literature that goes in that direction. And then in another direction, the, the idea of collaboration goes more down the path of democratic values. Um, and sort of throughout this presentation, I am going to touch on both concepts because they both have meaningful insights. But I would say in terms of, of the spirit of what the ANPF was hoping to achieve, it actually is a bit more applicable to uh, the literature is coming out of the democratic governance direction. Um, because there's the hope to try and address historically asymmetric power relations. And so this can have manifested itself through colonialism, um, but in certain ways it can actually uh, manifest itself through economic actors as well under certain circumstances. Um, so differentiating between terms, this is important as well, because I've seen um, in certain applications, people will actually use the terms collaborative governance and co-management almost interchangeably. But there are, although they're related terms, there is some nuance between them. When we're talking about collaborative governance, this will more typically involve uh, decision making, authority, and chains of accountability to create these more broad policy agendas, strategies, find alignment in value, those types of objectives, sort of the higher level objectives of trying to find a common alignment between parties. Uh, in contrast, once you get into co-management, this is the question of implementing the agreed upon strategies and agendas. So, want to highlight that nuance is important, although both concepts are meaningful where there's a desire to move away from more hierarchical types of power relations. So actually applying these terms, you know what we need to do? We need to re-examine some of the extremely fundamental assumptions, uh, which I think actually many of us may take for granted about how our governance structures are designed. Uh, Canada's system of delegated federalism is entirely predicated upon hierarchy. And over at University of Ottawa, I get into some hot conversations fairly often. I like to think of our Canadian system as one of multi-level governance, uh, where you have democratic mandates emerging from all different levels where people are elected. Certain constitutional scholars do not necessarily see it this way. They are very much more of um, sort of traditionalist readings of Canada's constitution, which situate the federal government as supreme. And uh, in many cases, they actually don't even recognize, before we even get to questions of indigeneity, they don't even recognize municipalities as actual levels of government. They see them as just jurisdictions formed as corporations to do implementation work without necessarily having anything to do with the people who elected them. So uh, how is it that we can move from these respective schools of thinking and actually take it even further? Well, there's quite a bit of literature uh, that has emerged using terms since the 1990s, like networked governance, um, which acknowledges that there's bilateral and horizontal relationships between a variety of different types of non-state actors. Um, and there's a number of ways that these things can manifest. 
what we, and I'm so sorry because I forgot that Zoom has the little tiles. So my slide is slightly obscure here, but basically what this slide is trying to convey is that there are a number of bundles of thought, each of which is actually founded on premises that are entirely culturally based. The concept of states as it was initially brought about to form Canada as a state, as a Western nation, um, follows in the Westminster history of parliamentary democracy, which of course uh, built on a number of ideas about exactly what politics is, how authority should be delegated from the individual to politicians to represent them, and what the rule of law is supposed to encompass in terms of protecting the individual. The idea of markets, again, many significant Western undertones in terms of how it is that we're supposed to have private property, how it is that states are supposed to protect private property. And there's a whole big field that is blocked by my Zoom tile to do with the different types of management, which now co-management has grown out of. But we need to rethink each of these fundamental pillars that we take for granted to understand how Indigenous values could possibly uh, be incorporated. So as I had mentioned, quite a bit of the literature around collaborative governance and co-management actually uh, is interested in decentralizing power, but the reason why is because there is this desire and intention to embrace the competitive logic of markets. And then so the question there, it's, it's less about trying to empower citizens and more about trying to achieve that value for money proposition, whereby instead of having things centrally controlled, think about like the old style, massive Soviet governments, uh, we move things away as we have since the 1970s from the federal government down to the provinces, down to the frontline service providers, municipalities, so on and so forth. And because they're closer to the work, they're able to accurately scope the work and then they're able to accurately issue contracts to private sector firms to do the work. And because there's all of these private sector operators, they're all competing against each other and we get great value for money because they'll just push the least uh, good contractors out of business. This is a lot of the idea about how it is that now work has been bifurcated throughout different levels of government and pushed out to uh, the private sector. And a vast amount of work about collaborative government and co-management actually gets into the detailed nuance of these questions. So if, for example, we're concerned about managing an existing asset, there's any number of ways you can do it. You can have a service contract, you can have a management contract, which is, of course, bigger and more long term than just servicing a piece of infrastructure. You can have an operate, maintain relationship. You can have a circumstance where you have a party actually leasing the asset and you see these things with big assets, right? From a governance perspective, uh, it, becomes, it becomes very significant because of the question of how information flows between parties, between either citizens directly or the elected officials that they are, that have been elected to represent said citizenry. Um, or maybe this everything is entirely under the purview of the private sector actors. You have, for example, power plants, you have highways that are entirely privately operated. You have, um, you have uh, LRTs that are delivered as three Ps. And I know from involving myself firsthand with a number of these projects, there can be a lot of strain when you have something that the public very much views as within the purview of publicness, something that's funded by public money, something that uh, is for their interests, but then because of the way the contract has been designed, sometimes almost entirely privately, uh, elected officials are sometimes not able to access information in order to act as intermediaries as some of these very big, very long projects go along. So as an infrastructure example, but it could also be applicable to housing, it could be applicable to hospitals, many things 
like this. So we start to understand that my visualization, I hope that it came across clearly, was meant to convey that when we're talking about co-governance, there's some very uh, fundamental questions about the chain of authority, collective action dilemmas, citizen engagement, how it is that the public interest can be determined over a duration of time. And if power is not centralized, if authority is fragmented, what are the power dynamics there? How is it that we can assure accountability? And on the simplest of terms, and if we, we take nothing away from, from this talk other than this, um, how is it that different organizational designs can achieve desirable levels of input legitimacy from the public and output legitimacy at the time that something is delivered? So there's deep questions. Right? There's deep questions about how we understand doing this work, how we understand citizens, how we understand the role of the state. And as I mentioned at the onset, uh, the design of Canada's government, as it has been for 100 years, now we're trying to do a few new things, and I think it's great. Uh, it had been previously conceived according to philosophical underpinnings from European and North American paradigms. So what am I really getting at? Well, in the West, there's a strong idea that people are individuals, that when they interact with a state, they are ceding some of their individual liberties, rights, freedom, the social contract, and you know whether it's Locke or Hobbes, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. This is the dynamic. This is the dynamic uh, that is that is highlighted. One of a security relationship between individuals and the state. You know, basically the the purpose of the state is just to protect individuals from the marauding others right, that may come to your village and, you know, set it on fire or what have you. Uh, it's to protect you and your property and humans are separate from nature. Well, as it turns out, these, these, a lot of these things, a lot of this focus on violence, a lot of the focus on the individual as opposed to the collective, uh, you know, these views are not entirely consistent with many other cultures around the world and may not be consistent with the views of uh, some North American indigenous peoples as well. Uh, it's a culturally informed way of understanding. And so we need to take a big step back. So whether it's from that standpoint or from my uh, colleagues over at U of O who are the constitutional scholars, this, there's this notion of power centralization uh, with the federal government versus these other parties, which may or may not need to be brought in to some degree, to some useful degree. And that's what we need to figure out how to do. If we were to take this very purely uh, statist perspective, well, these would be these would be the people. These are the elected federal uh, MPs and, and senators. I, I threw in um, a few from, you know, northern Quebec and uh, Labrador. Um, but I, I think that these constitutional readings, although they're very popular, I, I actually think that there's a, a good need to reevaluate them and take another step away. I completely appreciate and understand the need on one level to do nation to nation trust building and conversations and so forth, but to try and simplify those relationships in that way, I think overlooks a lot of important nuance and complexity on both sides. The world is not like this. It's absolutely not. The world is like this. This is how it really is. This is a great graphic. I absolutely love. Uh, ITK released a report uh, titled The Oceans That We Share. And for an area of interest in this case, maritime governance, they have all of the people who are involved actually listed out. And this is not a hierarchy. People are doing different work with regions, 
with localities, with territorial governments, federal government. I know there's a lot of acronyms. I see Peter's face is getting a little scrunched up, but um, what this graphic is supposed to convey to you is that in terms of the work being performed from the standpoint of people who need infrastructure, are using infrastructure, are benefiting from uh, shipping, safety services, all these different components of maritime governance, their understanding and their experience involves stakeholders from many different levels and not only many different levels of state governance, but also arm's length organizations as well. Uh, and in terms of accountability chains, I actually debated whether I should include this slide, but you don't need to have top-down hierarchies in order to have accountability chains. All kinds of organizations are set up as matrix organizations, and you can have horizontal chains of responsibility. And we already do. This is one of the arguments that I'm trying to make here. Implementation, practically speaking, because of the factors that I had mentioned before, whereby you had a lot of work pushed down from the federal center through to territories, down to local governments. In practice, a lot of implementation work is already fragmented out to specific locations, specific regions, specific groups, and these sorts of things. And I would argue that Canada is actually in a certain kind of a way in a good position to embrace these types of decentralatory tendencies. Weirdly, you know, when Canada was being colonized, involved not just one party, there was both the Indigenous people here, the British and the French. And one of the interesting outcomes of having two colonial powers is that many things which, for example, in the UK with their National Health Service, uh, are, are still highly national. Here in Canada, many of these things that other federations have retained, you know, tight levels of national control over, they've actually already been devolved down to provinces or territories. It's not everywhere in the world that provinces and territories have so much power as here. So this is already, if, if you get the direction that I'm going, it's already a form of power decentralization, of fragmentation, of accountability chains. And it's kind of in our way of thinking, it would be positive, I think, to actually perpetuate this kind of awareness and take it further as we contemplate how it is that more collaborative arrangements can be achieved. Because constitutionally, as I mentioned, the local governments, they, they do not have a lot of strength. Um, and so, you know, whether it's local bodies who are indigenous or local bodies who are uh, more so municipal councils, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. There's a really great scholar from UVic, Warren Magnuson, who has written about this at some length in terms of how values of democracy um, can be embodied in the empowerment of local governments. I think that is an important area for public administration scholars in Canada to continue to develop and to acknowledge both uh, the value and sometimes the difficulties and complexities of having the narrative be only one of consultation. Because certainly consultation can help the planning and design of programs and activities and where they are effective and successful, they can be incredibly valuable because you will have that grassroots level support that can maintain itself over long durations of time to get that buy-in. Um, but in worst case scenarios, you can end up going around in circles. You can end up with sometimes, unfortunately, negative outcomes where the dispersion of decision-making uh, can actually create more complexity. It can create confusion about who's accountable for what. It can create volatility and, and you know, levels of uh, concern about who really is accountable. So I'm drawing to a close here. Um, the note that I would like to wrap up on is that things are distinct in the North. And with respect to consultation, uh, there is a duty to 
consult. Indigenous communities form majority populations across Canada's north, and this, uh, you know, represents additional legal considerations with regards to community engagement. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has supplied some jurisprudence on this, which is still evolving, but very, very interesting. It actually ties back to the points I was making earlier about better recognizing elected officials across all different levels of government. The jurisprudence that has been established surrounding consultation recognizes that the collective Aboriginal rights of Aboriginal communities um, need to be addressed, not necessarily the concerns of a single Aboriginal individual, right? So this is very, this is very fundamental and very interesting and ties back for Aboriginal communities to broader questions for all of us about how it is that the, the public interest is actually determined. So one of the other things that the uh, Supreme Court has uh, provided is that designs for consultations should be attuned to democratically elected Aboriginal, Aboriginal leaders where possible, um, you know, with systems of elders and these sorts of things. It's not always the case, but there is interest there in um, the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court to recognize those leaders who have been elected from Aboriginal communities. Um, and the jury is still out in the absence of elected representatives exactly how it is that that public interest is determined. This is something that they're still working on. Uh, just a quick note in closing that uh, back around the same time that the AMPF was being founded, there was also a uh, Inuit Crown Partnership Committee that was formed at that time. And now five years later, they have just released uh, a report on how that's going. And it's an interesting read. I would recommend it. I'm not going to dig into all the details of it, but uh, if you if you should be so interested to give it a close read and maybe, you know, line up my slide deck right next to it, you may see some of the themes that I'm alluding to uh, line up with some of the things that they're finding in terms of how it is that they're trying to figure out both cultural issues and changes to uh, organizational groupings and institutional designs. Uh, there will always be a need for dialogue with the federal government and provincial governments, you know, as far as the nation to nation communications are concerned. But I think there's definitely room to elevate some of those other leaders from other groups. And that's for me. Hey, no, thank you so much for that opening presentation to our Emerging Leaders Node. You covered a tremendous amount of ground and a tremendous amount of ideas in that presentation. Uh, so, no, thank you very much. Um, I think what we'll do is, is we'll, we'll park the questions until both presenters have gone. I think that might generate a bit more of a free-flowing conversation. Uh, but if you do have questions uh, for Chris and you don't want to forget them or you want to make sure they're forwarded, please do message me on the chat. Um, or, of course, you can just hold them until the end and put your hand up and, and we'll get to them. Uh, thank you so much for that, Chris. Uh, Joe, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so firstly, uh, thank you to my fellow panelists, Chris. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm looking forward to reading more as well. And thank you to Dr. Kicker for chairing this panel. Uh, much appreciated for that as well. Um, it's an honor to be presenting at the fourth annual Nadsen Conference uh, here today. And thank you very much to Nicole and Ryan as well for coordinating these panels and to all involved in Nadsen. Uh, this is a really brilliant network and I've been involved in here since 2020. And yeah, I'm really happy to remain part of the collaboration. Okay, uh, before beginning the presentation today, it's essential to acknowledge where I'm presenting from and where I'm fortunate to live, work and play here in the Okanagan Territory over in British Columbia. Um, so I acknowledge and respect that Kelowna and the uh, the area reside on the land of the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silks and Okanagan peoples, 
I've been fortunate to collaborate with and learn from Indigenous people in Canada uh, by studying and particularly focusing on um, my master's on Indigenous politics in the Arctic. And I've learned a lot about the importance of Indigenous knowledge and non-Western ways of knowing and the value of listening and learning from others. Um, it's also important to share stories and one particular legend around this area of BC is that of Anhakait, or Ogopogo as non-Indigenous settlers have named it. And and Hakai is said to be a spirit of the lake or a sacred water being that protects the lake, looking kind of like a giant sea serpent that you can see on the slide here. Uh, so folklore is really fascinating to me and this transfers to other places around the globe. Um, this also reminds me of my Scottish heritage of the fabled Loch Ness Monster. Um, that's one of my favorite indigenous stories from this area. Uh, so before moving on, I'd just like to take a moment to um, acknowledge where we're tuning from today and how fortunate we are to be in such a great part of the world. Um, so I acknowledge that my presentation is coming from a slightly different perspective and following Chris's presentation. Uh, presently, I'm an early practitioner focusing on changing environment and climate change uh, mitigation strategies, particularly with emissions reduction. Uh, so following my graduation from Master of Arts at UVic, where I was supervised by Nads and co-lead Dr. Will Greaves, I started work with the BC Ministry of Environment. Uh, prior to this, I pre was predominantly focusing on uh, my research on Arctic security, Indigenous politics, and climate change. Uh, so the research opportunities I've held with Dr. Greaves and through Nadson have really shaped my understanding of climate change and security issues. And Arctic security and climate issues uh, remain of key importance to me and interest. Um, after all, it's the Arctic that's the forefront of climate change and the most impacted region of the globe. Okay, so within my position, I've been very fortunate to be able to continue academic style research to inform policy decisions and protocol development. I feel that my academic background and development has really shaped and helped me enter government. Uh, the research opportunities I've held with Nadsen as well, like no doubt helped my analysis and writing skills as well. And um, so during the past year of working in government, um, I started back in September last year. I've mostly been focusing on analyzing and researching climate change mitigation strategies, be it through in independently analyzing different mitigation tools or conducting jurisdictional scans of other provinces, states, and indigenous knowledge to inform executive decision makers on how best to proceed with developing and implementing protocol. Uh, so for instance, the jurisdictional scans that I've undertaken have comparably analyzed and presented data to inform branch directors and the Minister of Environment on uh, climate matters of urgent importance. Um, this is just a small part of the process to influence cabinet decisions and uh, change legislation. Um, however, my academic research is quintessential to informing policy and decision makers. Um, I've recently been working with the private sector scientists and researchers across Canada, provincially and federally with the ECCC, so Environment Climate Change Canada. I'm working with and collaborating with international forums, such as um, UNCOP as well, and other nonprofit organizations with the intention of knowledge sharing and informing policy development. So it's become quite evident that changing environment has encompassed every part of government from international organizations to federal and provincial, definitely here in Canada, and the increased funding for research and policy analysts um, with climate change mitigation has demonstrated that a changing environment is surely becoming a security issue, whereby emissions mitigation and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions are at the forefront of security in many states now and the international community. Um, I don't think I need to reiterate just how impactful climate change has been on the northern environment as well. So hopefully this slide links uh, nicely to Chris's topic. Um, it's quite evident that there's been a, a securitization of climate change in recent years within the public sector. For instance, the ministry I'm currently working in has been recently established, and there are new branches and ministries in BC being created that are climate conscious and focused on mitigation strategies to address climate change, such as the newly developed Ministry of Waters, Land and Resource Stewardship, also aptly named as WALRUS as acronyms. And there's also a Jedi ministry as well for any Star Wars fans out there. So they just keep creating these different acronyms there. Uh, despite shifting away from solely 
working in academia, it appears that international relations theory and particularly securitization theory, um, is, which has been particularly prominent in Arctic security discourse, uh, remains quite prevalent and transcends borders of academic thought. This can be seen through climate change mitigation tools. Um, so the area that I'm working in, there are engineered solutions such as carbon capture storage and carbon dioxide reduction strategies, um, which are developing. And there's also marine carbon and direct air capture technologies as well, which has been really interesting to learn about. Uh, forest carbon strategies such as reforestation, avoided deforestation and things such as tree planting are also further natural solutions to change, a changing environment. Um, alongside this, we have other nature-based solutions or NPS, as we say in the emissions reduction realm, uh, that focuses on natural solutions such as marine carbon, forest intertidal, wetland reservation and peatland restoration to sequester carbon dioxide. So of course, this, um, these solutions can translate to Arctic greenhouse gas emissions reduction, which is quite evidently the most important area to focus on. Um, I'm quite interested to see how nature-based solutions and engineered solutions develop in the Arctic as well. Uh, the most effective way to mitigate uh, disruptive environmental changes in the Arctic sea ice system is to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this, is, uh, this must be applied globally in order to protect and secure Arctic ecosystems and sea ice for the future. So throughout the research and analysis I've conducted in recent months, I've um, been comparently analyzing biological and mechanical solutions. And a majority of this points to nature-based solutions as a more financially viable and effective carbon dioxide reduction strategy over mechanical in the long run. And this is due to scale and cost mostly. Um, however, as the Arctic is such a complex ecosystem, this is an interesting discussion on how to best approach Arctic greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And I'm extremely interested in the topic and look further to uh, research on this matter. There's also a project that I'll discuss um, that I'm conducting with Nats and Co. Lead, Dr. Greaves that I'll touch upon later as well. Uh, so what I've learned so far from my brief experience in the public sector is that policy and academic research are inherently intertwined in a type of mutually beneficial relationship in which academia and public policy inform one another. I've been particularly drawn to securitization theory since working in Arctic securitization of climate change in grad school and the research I've conducted through Natsun as well. I've also realized that it's hard to step away from academia and I've accepted that it's an essential part of um, informing policy change um, to reduce emissions. Um, so forewarning to any other graduate uh, fellow here at Natsun today who is looking to leave academia following graduation because it might remain integral part of your life if you're moving into government. Hopefully that's not too triggering. Um, so academia is essential for informing and developing and implementing policy and protocol. So collaboration of both the hard sciences and social sciences is fundamental for advancing policy and ensuring a transparency of ideas and knowledge sharing with um, the context of a changing environment. So throughout my current work, I've had the pleasure of um, connecting with some of the top climate scientists in Canada, the United States and beyond to assist with developing and recommending strategies for climate change uh, protocols. Uh, for instance, this week, I met with a group of marine scientists who are currently focusing on Canada's marine carbon sink in the Canadian Arctic, uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so research like this is essential for informing policy making and protocol development. So collaborating with academic research and researchers like this and my team uh, currently developing a blue carbon protocol, um, which we've been collaborating with scientists and academics throughout Canada to better understand uh, carbon dioxide redu reduction strategies and sequestration strategies as well. And so we're currently looking into marine carbon sinks as a key tool for nature-based solutions to counteract uh, climate change. And an outcome of this discussion forum has led to observations, modeling, recommendations and sharing of indigenous co-generation of knowledge to better inform uh, decision-making. And I've also had the pleasure of connecting with um, other Northern nonprofits and research collaborations such as Ocean North, um, if anyone's ever heard of Ocean North before, who are carrying out some really fascinating work um, such as conducting research data on Arctic kelp and some other really interesting work on noise pollution in the Arctic. 
um, and how this is impacting marine life and migration routes as well. Uh, so once again, this links to a changing environment and bodes a question with sea ice melting. Um, are we going to see more traffic in the north and will um, will this be impacting ecosystems and traditional ways of living in the north as well? So to link it to bridging the gap, um, there's mostly definitely a certain difference between academia and writing and policy writing, um, yet the two are quite interconnected. We can't have good policy on the changing environment without research and academic writing. And in a way, academia oftentimes requires policy and governmental decisions in order to advise and guide practitioners as well. Um, ultimately, this helps bridge the gap uh, between policy and academic writing, and which has become very apparent within my uh, field of work in climate change. Uh, so admittedly, I've learned quite a lot and acknowledged that my academic writing is not so welcome in the policy world. Uh, therefore, I've had to adjust my writing style a little, a little bit to uh, transfer skills from academia, uh, which has obviously been invaluable in the, the work I've done, and that's been essential to um, coming into government so far. But, um, yeah, government writing definitely be, appears to be a little bit more succinct. Um, otherwise, expect major revisions, which could be uh, triggering to people here as well. Uh, so moving on to Indigenous knowledge, um, in alignment and respect to the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it's been fundamental to work with, listen and learn from Indigenous peoples and gain crucial knowledge to mitigate climate change and counteract our changing environment. Um, indigenous peoples as ancestral environmental stewards of the land and waters offer essential indigenous knowledge, which can greatly benefit our understanding of climate change. Um, indigenous peoples make up around 5% of the global population. However, they protect 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. And it's this first-hand knowledge of changing environment that we must learn and listen from. Uh, so within government so far, I've experienced and engaged um, with various bilateral discussion forums between provincial and indigenous government. Uh, this is critical to ensure that protocol development develops and seeks to benefit all in society and have the transparency of ideas and knowledge as well. Uh, so no longer can government continue without consulting indigenous government and gain the essential insight necessary to combat climate change. Uh, linking to um, greenhouse gas um, emissions once again and government to government relations. Um, I've been recently collaborating in consultation with over 60 First Nations across BC uh, within the development of forest carbon strategies uh, that ensures that conservation and reforestation of forests occurs in BC. Uh, this has been a five year protocol development process, um, which just shows how the typical stereotype of slow moving government is very real. Um, but it does seem to be a back and forth collaboration to ensure that government and indigenous um, protocol um, develop with transparency from there. Um, we've recently been working with an initiative called the Great, Great Bear Rainforest Initiative that takes place on the northern west coast of Canada. And this has been established to protect over 6.5 million hectares of forest and sequesters 100 million uh, sorry, 1 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. And it's initiatives like this that protect and can help uh, mitigate climate change. So we're now seeking um, consultation and collaboration on other protocol development, which has been proving to be quite a rewarding and engaging experience. Uh, within this process, I've constantly thought of how initiatives like this can translate to other areas of the world, and particularly with Inuit, whose traditional ways of life are being threatened in the Arctic. So recent droughts and other climate uh, disasters have greatly affected salmon populations in the West and forest fires are a constant issue uh, with this season's wildfire season being one of the worst in Western Canada's history. And I think it's safe to say that um, a changing environment has seemed to be impacting the globe. Um, we all saw what happened with the wildfires on the East Coast recently and saw the viral pictures um, occurring in New York City as well, which really cemented how this is an interconnected global problem. So linking this back to Arctic security, um, government to government relations experience on the West Coast lately have really made me think about how Arctic security will progress further with government to government relations and collaboration. In terms of collective security, knowledge sharing and international forums, it's essential to continue 
to develop and collaborate mitigation tools and strategies. For example, how are we uh, best to address new developments in the Arctic, um, such as emissions from uh, the methane super leaks that we're seeing in placing melt off the coast of eastern uh, East Siberian coast, Alaska and Norway. Uh, does this require international forums to discuss mitigation strategies? Um, for instance, with methane being scientifically estimated to have a warming potential of 80 times more than CO2, uh, this is yet another security issue in the Arctic um, that we need to address collectively again. Uh, so climate security will develop further as quite possibly one of the greatest existential threats that we face um, for governments, NGOs, scientists, and more to collaboratively work to seek uh, new solutions to new security dilemmas. Um, it's fantastic that a network such as NADSEN is integrating climate change and environmental security into the forefront of research and security discourse. Um, with climate change implications for defense and security on NADSEN website now, uh, this once again portrays um, a securitization of climate change um, into what has previously been quite a different um, notion of security. So despite the disruption of the Arctic Council and collaborative Arctic security discourse in recent years, uh, networks such as NADSEN remain essential to not only identifying climate as a security issue, but addressing and counteracting uh, climate issues. So academic discourse um, such as NADSEN as well will remain integral to uh, policy and international cooperation. Just move on to the last couple of slides here. Um, so oftentimes academia and policy can be seen as in a state of some type of internal conflict. Um, I've experienced that in consultations with government, um, which can be of both be amusing and frustrating at the same time. Um, however, it's necessary to ensure that we bridge the gap and work collaboratively to develop solutions that interconnect not only the Arctic, but the entire globe. Uh, so climate change being a global phenomenon, this transcends borders and boundaries, and we need to collaborate to continue to uh, tackle a changing environment. And networks such as NADSEN and other knowledge producing organizations are essential for this. Um, I'm also particularly interested to see how um, the future of the Arctic Council plays out. Despite, despite political disputes, forums like this are of course integral to collective security and addressing a changing climate. Um, import, the importance of government-to-government uh, -government relations, academic works and policy development in an interconnected world um, has a, have ensured that I've stayed engaged in academia and understand the importance that scholars um, such as NADSEN and other networks as a whole offer. Um, this is the main reason I'm um, seeking further research opportunities with NADSEN and staying in touch with uh, Dr. Greaves as well. Uh, so currently I'm co-authoring a book chapter titled Desircuitization, Independence and Normal Politics in Kalali Nunat and Inuit Nunangat. Um, this is going to be featured in an upcoming book titled Greenland in Arctic Security. Um, I've had the pleasure of co-authoring alongside Natsen co lead Will Greaves and also Natsen graduate fellow Nicholas Andrews. And this chapter is focusing on climate change securitization and desecuritization in Canada and Greenland. And this offers a comparative analysis. Um, you can see the on the bottom there, we have a very early graphic of what the, the book cover will be looking like, which is interesting to me, the most exciting part, finally, three years later. Um, so we're they're actually the only Canadian and non um, and North American contributors to this project. Um, so we're looking forward to sharing this once the, this has been published through Michigan University Press and we'll no doubt be updating um, Natsen on this as well. Uh, this should be hopefully later this year. So I'm promising myself an early Christmas present, but I was saying that this time last year. So we all know how, how long academic publications take. Um, as discussed with uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, being identified as a key mitigation strategy for meeting international climate targets, um, Dr. Greaves and I are also working on a new research project that is focusing on analyzing and assessing military emissions in the Arctic. Um, we're in the very early stages of this at the moment, um, but I'm sure we'll be updating um, the network again once we develop this uh, research project further. I'm looking forward to um, hearing more about other people's research as well. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening and bearing with me on what is not a typical academic type of Nadsen presentation. Um, I'm happy just to discuss any questions or other related issues 
Uh, to get the ball rolling, I'll ask a few questions that may help facilitate discussion after as well. Um, so how can we further bridge the gap between policymakers and academics to fight a changing environment in the North? Um, secondly, how can academia further influence Arctic policy? And what are the barriers that we face in the North with addressing climate change as well? Um, so I look forward to hopefully seeing you in the social later on. And I'll now cede the floor back to 